Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin Wassalatu wassalamu ala nabi al-kareem wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in So Alhamdulillah we have reached the final session on our Hijaz quran Miraculous Nature of the Qur'an presentation and we still have a lot of content to cover so inshallah I'm hoping to cover all of it today if today's session feels a bit rushed uh, please forgive me I'm trying to cover at least another 8 more slides in in today's presentation and we're already starting about five minutes late. So uh, initially we're going to do one hour on a case study and then one hour on refuting those who claim to be claim that there are mistakes in the Quran. So I'm gonna try to split it maybe 20 minutes on a case study and half an hour on the uh, mistakes issue. And then inshallah, uh, if we split it that way, we should be able to cover both topics. So for case study, very simply, uh, I think it's important that we, when we study the various surahs of the Quran, that we look at them from a perspective of, uh, uh, of the miraculous nature of the Quran. Any surah. You can actually take any surah of the Quran and study it from this perspective. In this case, for example, uh, we're looking at surah al-ikhlas. So why did I choose surah al-ikhlas? Two reasons. Number one, we don't have much time, so I chose a short surah. Right? If we're going to do a full one hour, I would have done maybe Surah Yusuf or Surah Waqiyah. But we are doing this in about 10 or 15 minutes, so Surah Al-Ikhlas uh, will suffice. Number two, the Surah Al-Ikhlas is actually one of the surahs where you can really see the miracle of the Quran. Like many of the miracles of the Quran are linked directly to this one tiny surah made up of four ayat that all of us have memorized, right? All of us, inshallah, have memorized this surah. So, we say one of the miracles of the Quran is that it promotes the best understanding of Tawheed. And this surah summarizes the entire concept of Tawheed in four short verses. Think about this, right? Think about the fact that you have four verses, four lines of poetry as the Arabs would have looked at it. And in these four lines, you have all of Aqidah, all of Tawheed. Everything you need to know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is mentioned in these four lines. And at the same time, it rhymes, it's eloquent, it's the best choice of words. It's all of this, while at the same time, giving you a perfect description of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So an example of the perfect choice of words is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word ahad instead of wahid. When he says, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, say he is Allah al ahad. Now, generally in Arabic, when you are saying something is one, you use the word wahid. That's what we all learned in school, right? Wahid. But in this verse, Allah uses the word al ahad, not wahid. Why al ahad? Because al ahad means uniquely one. When you say wahid, you mean like one out of a hundred, one out of a thousand, one out of a million. It's one, but out of something else. But when you use the word al-ahad, al you are not just saying Allah is one, but you're saying that he is the only one in this specific category. So again, we have perfect choice of words. We have perfect poetry. All four lines rhyme. Allah is telling us there is only one God. There is nothing like him. He does not have any children. All of these various concepts related to Tawheed, which we have entire books about. Each of these concepts you have entire books about are summarized in four lines that rhyme perfectly, right? Then we say another miracle of the Quran is that it is easy for people to memorize even if they don't understand a single word of it. And this is a perfect example of that. Almost every Muslim in the world has memorized Surah Al-Ikhlas even if they don't understand a single word of Arabic even if they, if they don't understand Surah Al-Ikhlas, they can recite it perfectly from their memory, right? Why? This, this hibs of the Quran is part of the miracle of the Quran. Then there's the tafsir. We said that one of the miracles of the Quran is how deep each verse is. That you can have entire books on each verse of the Quran. Now look at Surah Al-Ikhlas. It's four verses. But Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam described these four verses as equal to one third of the Quran. And again, the ulama have said there's two meanings of it being one third of the Quran. The first meaning is that it is 
that if you recite it three times, you get the reward of the entire Quran, right? That's the first meaning. But the second meaning of it being one third of the Quran is that the Quran's message is divided into three messages. The oneness of Allah, uh, the afterlife, and the uh, Risala of the prophets, right? That these are the three parts of Aqidah. And one third of the Quran focuses on Tawheed, on the oneness of Allah. And the entire one third of the Quran is summarized in these four lines. So you can take these four lines and you can expand upon them with tafsir upon tafsir upon tafsir. You can do tafsir of the Quran with the Quran and you can bring in on one third of the Quran as extra verses. You can do tafsir of the Quran with hadith and you can bring in uh, the hadiths that explain these verses. You can do tafsir of the Quran uh, from an Akira perspective and you can bring in long explanations of each verse. You can write entire books explaining the surah. And then you can explain it from a thematic perspective. You can explain it uh, from a, uh, a narration perspective, from an opinion perspective. There are so many ways to go into it that really, if you actually take the time to study Surah Ali class, you are studying one third of the Quran. If you actually understand the Surah, you understand the message of one third of the Quran, which is there is only one God and there is nothing like him. He does not have any children and oh, yeah. he is alive of anyone. Finally, we have that the uh, in the final. Uh, what if people are in and out of our? No, you mustn't. Uh, remind everyone who is logging online to just mute their. This okay, so the message of uh, of the surah finally it agrees with the fitna, and it is the most logical description of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala in any religion. You know how many people have converted to Islam just from this one surah? Just from this one surah. When you read the biographies of people who have converted to Islam, you will find hundreds of people that just this one surah alone was enough to convince them that this is the true message of Allah. Why? Because the message of the surah, the description of God in the surah, matches exactly what's already in the human soul, what's already in your fitra. That your fitra doesn't believe in a God that is like a human being. Your fitra doesn't believe in a God that is uh, that, that is multiple in nature, or that has a father, or that has a son, or has a family. All of these are man-made concepts. Right? The fitra already has this idea that there's only one God and there's nothing like him, he has no beginning, he has no end. And this is the message of Surah Al-Ikhlas. So, when you study Surah Al-Ikhlas, you see the perfect message of Tawheed. You see a message that matches with our fitra. You see a message that is perfect in its eloquence, perfect in its poetry and rhyming, perfect in its word choice. A message that can be memorized by anyone with these, right? even if they don't understand it. A message so deep that it's equal to one third of the Quran and entire books can be written about it. And finally, what was the challenge given to the Quraysh? Produce one surah like it. Not a single pagan of Makkah took up the challenge to produce one surah like Surah Al-Ikhlas or Surah al ghosal We're not talking about producing a surah that's 500 verses long or 200 verses long. This is four verses. Could any of their masters of poetry produce four verses of equal brilliance and depth as these four verses? They didn't even try. They didn't even try. Why? Because they looked at this and they said, this is not something that a human can Invent. This is something beyond human abilities, and that's why those who still wanted to reject it, they called it magic, right? Because they couldn't come up with any human explanation for it. So you see, with one surah like Surah Al Ikhlas, we have the all these different angles to come from, and you take your time and reflect on. You can break down word for word. You can look at the miraculous usage of the word "kul," the mirac miraculous, miraculous meaning of the word "astomat." You can look at how Allah described that He has no children, noise or anything like Him. And the word he used over there, how general it is, right? So, for example, the word used over there doesn't mean he doesn't he has no son. It means he has no child, right? The word used includes both genders. There are many words he could have used over there, but he chose specifically the word that includes both genders. Why? Because the pagans of Makkah believed that the angels were the daughters of Allah. So this verse is refuting them. Meanwhile, the Christians had believed that Jesus was the son of Allah. And so this verse was refuting them as well. So it's refuting both by having the most generalized uh, choice of words, the most perfect choice of words that still somehow rhyme 
with the rest of the surah. And so like this, in one surah, we see the miraculous nature of the Quran. Now, with this, we come to our final topic. And that is, you know, whenever we bring up this topic and we tell people about the Quran being miracle, we always get the, but, you know, uh, but I've been on a certain website on Google and, uh, you know, I, I found a thousand mistakes in the Quran, right? Or a thousand reasons why uh, the Quran is not from Allah. And you always get these questions coming from like from teenagers or people in their uh, early 20s who are discovering the, the, these things for the first time. So they get very shocked and very scared. And they're like, I found a website by a Christian preacher who claims there's a hundred mistakes in the Quran. We are finished. What are we going to do? You say, relax. These so-called mistakes have been pointed out throughout the ages. And they have been refuted throughout the ages. You will find a Christian preacher coming today and bringing a certain so-called mistake in the Quran. And you find a book written a thousand years ago that addresses the same point and says that some people are saying this is a mistake in the Quran. This is the explanation. Right? These are not new things that they are bringing about. These are recycled arguments. And they are very simple ways to deal with it. Now, generally what we do is we take every single one of these examples, right? And we refute them one by one. What I want to do is teach you a methodology instead. A, list, a checklist to go through that can help you to refute any argument that is raised against the Quran. Right? A simple check, a checklist that will help you to refute any argument that is raised against the Quran. So the first thing is you don't always accept the premise of the other person. Right? If the other person is telling you that this is a mistake in the Quran, you don't automatically say, oh, it's a mistake in the Quran. No, hold on. What, they, what are they actually saying? You will find most of the time it's a mistranslation, right? That the translation they are using is wrong. The translation they are using is not what the verse actually means. Or it's a misunderstanding. The Quran is saying one thing, they are understanding completely differently, right? Or they didn't study the tafsir of the verse, right? And this is very common. I mean, how many non Muslims actually study tafsir? How many Muslims actually study tafsir, right? And you'll find many of these verses have been explained in the books of tafsir. So some of our tafsir authors, they, they focus on what they call the mushkilat al Quran, the difficult to understand verses of the Quran. And they would say that this verse, the Christians you know, think it's a mistake, but this is what it actually means. So when you go into the tafsir, you'll find, okay, there's a perfectly reasonable explanation for this verse, it is not a mistake. Then we have what I think is the most common today. Right? I see this almost every day on the internet. And that is when a verse of the Quran or a hadith is clearly a metaphor or Arabic proverb or, or Arabic idiom, we have some people taking it literally. Right? And I'll give you some examples of that. Right? This is very, very common. People say, oh, I found a mistake in the Quran. And when you read it, it's very obvious that that verse is meant to be metaphorical. And that person is taking it literal. Number five is a lack of understanding of Arabic eloquence and grammatical exception. So one of the things they like to do is they like to say that uh, the Quran has grammar errors. And they make a list of grammar errors in the Quran. And this is coming from people who don't understand Arabic. People who haven't studied Arabic are pointing out grammar errors in the Quran. The problem with this is that Arabic grammar books were written long after the Quran was revealed based on the perfect grammar and eloquence of the Quran. Right? It's not the other way around. It's not like a thousand years before Islam, they, they wrote out the, the, the laws of grammar and then the Quran came to agree with that. It's the other way around. The Quran was revealed first and based on the perfect grammar of the Quran, the laws of grammar were taught. Right? Now what happens is sometimes in any language, the way we speak, the words we use, our grammar, our, our choice of words, they change over time. So certain forms of grammar that were, that were common in the early years may not be common today. So someone who only knows contemporary Arabic may think something's a mistake in the Quran. But when you go back to how Arabic was spoken at that time, at the, at the height and perfection of Arabic, you find it's not a mistake. It was a common figure of speech at that time. Uh, a good example of this is the, is the verse that they always point out, Tilkal Rusul. Right? Tilkal Rusul, these prophets 
or these messengers, uh, according to modern grammar laws, it should be ula ikarusul. Tilka is used for non-human zones. Right? This is the grammar rule. However, when you go back to the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you will find that many Arab tribes would use the word tilka with a plural like rusul. It was the norm of that time. It was only hundreds of years later that the cultural norms shifted, and this stopped being normal. Right? So it looks like a mistake because we don't understand the Arabic of that. And this is why one of the rules of tafsir is that always understand the Quran based on the Arabic of the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi Don't try to interpret the Quran based on modern Arabic because the meanings of words change, the grammat grammatical usages, this is with every language, right? Meanings of words change, our grammatical usage changes. So for example, the Quran has the word sayyara. What does the word sayyara mean today? A car. Does the Quran speak about cars? No, at that time, sayyara meant a caravan, a group of people traveling together. So when the word sayyara is used in the Quran, you understand it in the meaning of the word of the Quran or the meaning of Arabic at that time, not in contemporary Arabic, right? And finally, finally, we have unfortunately many, many cases of purposeful and blatant misinterpretation. Very, very often when people claim there's a mistake in the Quran, they are purposely and blatantly misinterpreting the Quran to make it look like a mistake, even though they themselves know that this is not what the Quran means. And that is the worst case of them all because here they are being dishonest. In the first five cases, you can say, okay, they misunderstood, you know, uh, let's explain it to them. But in the sixth case, this is a person, you know, being very purposefully dishonest and misinterpreting the Quran. So let's look at examples of all of this, right? Let's start with mistranslations. So sometimes somebody tells you they found a mistake in the Quran. They may claim it's a scientific mistake or it's a, it's a logical mistake or something of this nature. Very often, what they claim to be a mistake is just a matter of translation. The most common example, the Quran says that the heavens and earth were created in six days, six a yam, right? Now, you will have people claiming this is scientifically impossible. Why? How do we measure days? By the rotation of the earth. So how is six days occurring before the earth is created? Right? You get the, the argument, right? This is the argument they made. Well, when you go back to actual classical Arabic, and by the way, this is actually a point, even though it's being brought up today by scientists, you actually find tafsir books written a thousand years ago that address it. And they said that a yam doesn't mean days. A yam means a set period of time, right? Like Allah says in the Quran, a day, a, a yom in the sight of Allah is like a thousand years on earth. So it's not talking about the earth's rotation. It's talking about a set period of time in the sight of Allah. It says the day of judgment is equal to 50,000 years. So again, nothing to do with rotations of the earth, nothing to do with 24 hour periods. Yom means a period of time. And so they say in this verse, again, this is the classical interpretation of this verse. Yom does not mean a 24-hour day. It doesn't mean that the earth was created in six 24-hour days. It simply means six blocks of time, six periods of time, uh, six uh, groups of time, right? Like six blocks. Just imagine that early time before all of this existed was put into six blocks. Right, where different creations came about, and therefore you have a meaning that makes sense. Now, this is the most obvious example where a translation where a meaning gets lost in translation. The word yom in Arabic means days, but the word yom in Arabic also means blocks of time or periods of time. Now, when you translate it to English and you translate it as days, the other meaning gets lost. Right? And that's why we go back to the early books and we find that all of the dictionaries. All of the Quranic dictionaries, when you open to the word yom, they have the meaning days, comma, blocks of time, comma, periods of time. So all of these are equal meanings of the word yom. So therefore, this is not a mistake in the Quran. And there are many other issues where they uh, translate uh, something in a certain way and they say, oh, this is a mistake in the Quran or a problem with the Quran. But in reality, it is simply just a translation issue. The next point is misunderstandings. And there are four main misunderstandings upon which people build their so-called mistakes in the Quran. Number one is 
the existence of non-Arabic words in the Quran. So this is the argument that the uh, that the, those who criticize the Quran make. The argument is that the Quran says it was revealed in clear Arabic or in pure Arabic. But there are words in the Quran that are not Arabic in nature. What do you mean by not Arabic in nature? For example, the names Ismail and Ibrahim come from which language? Hebrew. Hebrew. These are Hebrew words, right? But they have been Arabicized and become part of Arabic. And so they are in the Quran. And there are many other words like this in the Quran. So they are saying, how can this be pure Arabic if there are words borrowed from other languages in the Quran? Now, what this is, this is people not understanding how languages work. If I say I'm going to give a language in pure English, I'm going to give a lecture in pure English, right? And in my lecture, I use the word algebra. And someone say, hold on, algebra's roots are Arabic. You can't use that word. Your lecture is supposed to be in pure English. Does that argument make any sense? It makes no sense because that word is now part of the English language. It is now something you use in the English language, even though its roots are Arabic. In fact, if you look at the English language today, most of the words we use come from other languages. If you actually break down your conversations on a daily basis, you will find you are using words that are Latin in nature, words that are Arabic in nature. And in South Africa, we use words that are Afrikaans in nature, words that are Zulu in nature. And we have all these different languages that we bring together. And if the word is now officially part of the language, it's still considered pure English. The Arabic is the same. So when they say they found a mistake in the Quran, the Quran claims to be pure Arabic, but it borrows words from other languages. We say, that's not a problem. Those words have been Arabicized. They are now part of the Arabic language. These names like Ismail and Ibrahim, they are now Arabic names, right? Which are a bit different from the Hebrew version. So it does not in any way contradict the claim that the Arabic of the Quran is pure. Then, Another argument they make that's based on a misunderstanding is they'll say, oh, you'll say the Quran is perfectly preserved. So why are there 10 versions of the Quran? Right? This is the argument they make. Why are there 10 versions of the Quran if you claim that the Quran is perfectly preserved? What do you think is the response to that? There aren't 10 versions of the Quran. There are 10 recitations of the Quran. And the perfect preservation of the Quran is so perfect that all 10 recitations have been preserved word for word with perfect tajweed, with full chains of narrators from people today going all the way back to the Prophet. It has been preserved in all 10 forms. Now, one of the reasons they can't understand this is because the whole, part, the whole idea of 10 recitations of the Quran is a otherworldly concept. It's not something that humans invent or humans do. Humans don't have 10 recitations of their book, right? Where one or two words are different to bring in extra meaning to extra eloquence, right? We don't have this. This is a otherworldly concept. This is one of the one of the aspects of the Quran that make it beyond human. The fact that we have 10 recitations, all of which come from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. All, all 10 go back to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and all 10 we have perfectly preserved right until today. Again, the only point they don't understand it, the only reason they don't understand it is they're looking at 10 versions, like how you have different versions of the Bible. But it's not 10 versions. If you look at the Bible, some versions have more chapters than others. Entire books and chapters have been removed because some people believe those chapters belong in the Bible, others say it doesn't belong. There's nothing like this in the Quran. Rather, every Muslim believes that all 10 recitations are from Allah. All 10 recitations have been perfectly preserved. There's no one recitation with 113 surahs, or one recitation with 150 surahs, or one recitation with 90 surahs. No. All of them have 114 surahs. All of them have the same verses. All of them have the, the, the exact same Quran. The only differences are in the areas where Allah has revealed multiple things. Right? And so this means, means that we need to bring about the understanding what does multiple readings actually mean? Now, in the past, in the past, we would shy away from this topic. In the past, a lot of Muslims, especially in, in uh, certain cultures, would completely um, ignore this topic. They wouldn't teach their children about it. They wouldn't teach their students about it. They wouldn't allow it to come up in the dawah. 
you know, they, they, would, they would say that the Quran has been preserved, that every Fatha and Dhamma and Qasra is exactly as it was in the time of Rasulullah. Now, what's the problem with that argument? When you say every Fatha, Dhamma, and Qasra is exactly the same as it was in the Prophet's time. In the Prophet's time, there were no Fatha, Dhamma, and Qasra. Yeah, there were no dots to Right? The Quran was revealed in a way that allowed for multiple meanings. Later on, dots and vowel signs were added in to make it easy for non arabs to read. And these were standardized according to the culture of the people based on different recitations. So some people adopted the recitation of one uh, Qari, another uh, adopted the recitation of a different Imam. And then all of these became standardized into 10 recitations. But they all go back to Rasulullah. And so when we say that every dot and every fatha, dhamma, and kasra is exactly the same as it was in the time of the Prophet Wasallam, that is a mistake in our argument. Rather, a stronger argument is that there are 10 recitations of the Quran and all 10 go back to Rasulullah Wasallam and allows for multiple styles of reading. There are many different ways to recite the surah, all of which are acceptable. So the meaning does change in a few verses, but it's complementary meaning, not contradictory. Meaning. Yeah, it's complementary, not contradictory. So again, we shouldn't say the meaning doesn't change because then say, hold on, Surah Fatiha, Malik Yomidin and Malik Yomidin have two different meanings. So we say it's, it's, the meaning changes sometimes, but it's complementary. Malik Yomidin, Master of the Day of Judgment, Malik Yomidin, King of the Day of Judgment. There's no contradiction there. Allah is both. Part of Allah's infinite uh, kalam and his perfect recitation or, or revelation is that instead of revealing a double verse, instead of revealing Malik Yomidin, Malik Yomidin, he just revealed this one verse in two ways to give us two of, his, uh, two, uh, two of his attributes in one go. Right? So there are multiple meanings, but they complement each other. And this is a huge miracle. Ten recitations of the Quran with slightly different meaning, and you still can't find a single contradiction. That's humanly impossible for anyone to put together something of this nature. Okay. The third argument they make is that they claim to find contradictions in the Quran. Now, again, this is an area where a lot of us get flustered. A very simple argument against the so-called contradiction in the Quran. We need to define what is a contradiction. If we don't define what is a contradiction, they can be calling something a contradiction, but in your mind, it's not a contradiction. Why? Because you'll have two different definitions, right? So, for example, the Quran says there is no uh, compulsion in religion, but the Quran also calls for jihad. And say, oh, there's a contradiction, right? Or the Quran tells you uh, in one verse, the Quran says that the idda of a woman is one year, of a widow is one year. And another verse, it says four months and 10 days. So you say, oh, there's a contradiction. These are not contradictions. A contradiction, the definition of a contradiction is two opposite meanings that cannot be reconciled. That there's no way to reconcile it. For example, if somebody said, uh, if the Quran or anyone had to say, for example, that Moses died in a certain year, and then another one says Moses died in a different year, this is now a contradiction. You can't reconcile two different dates of death. There's no way to reconcile this. All these points in the Quran where people claim that there's a contradiction, it is often reconciled very easily either logically or through tafsir or through abrogation, right? So for example, uh, there's no compulsion in religion and the verse of jihad. It's a very simple logical explanation. There's no contradiction, right? You can't force a person to accept Islam, right? You can't. That's not what jihad is. Jihad was the Muslims expanding the borders of the Muslim empire, but the people in the empires remain Christian, they remain Jews, they remain Zoroastrian, they remain Hindus. Nobody forced them to become Muslims. They remain following the original religions. There's no contradiction here. Or the other example I gave, uh, the verse saying the, 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 the Idda is one year and the, and the verse saying the Idda is four months and ten days. What's the explanation for that? It's on the board. What do you think is the explanation for that? Oh, for widows I'm talking about, right? For the widow, it says, there's two verses about the widow. One says one year, one says four months and ten days. The very simple explanation is on the board. Abrogation. Every single book of Tafsir explains that in the first year of Hijra, the one year Idda was revealed. And about a few years later, it was reduced to four months and ten days. And both verses remain in the Quran 
to show us how Allah made things easier for people. So if Allah wanted, you could have kept it one. But he made it easier by reducing it to four months. So both verses are in the Quran, or one abrogates the other. Right? So that's why even when you read the translation of the Quran, with the verse saying that the idda of a widow is one year, they always have a footnote or bracket saying this verse has been abrogated. Right? So again, here the explanation is abrogation. But that brings up another issue that they raise. The concept of abrogation is something that uh, a lot of people are uncomfortable with. Right? Especially uh, non-Muslims, especially people who are hearing about it for the first time. Abrogation, you know, when people hear about it, they think of it like, oh, God changed his mind. That's what they think of, right? They, oh, first he thought this way, then he thought that way. Okay, that's a good point, right? So, abrogation means, like, this is the point. If you understand, by the way, a lot of these issues can be avoided if you understand definition. If you get the definitions right, all of these things get solved. So, one of the main problems with abrogation, as we said, is we don't know what it means. Many of us don't know. We say abrogation, we don't know what it means. Abrogation means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed certain laws at certain time and later on replaced them with other laws, right? And those laws were from the beginning meant to be temporary, right? So, for example, I'll give you a very, some very simple example from that. Uh, initially, it was haram to visit the grave. Initially, it was haram to visit the grave. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I used to prevent you from visiting the graveyards. Now you may visit them to remember them. So this hadith abrogates any hadith that, should, that says that it's haram to visit the graveyard. Why? Because what happened was certain laws were revealed just for the Sahaba as a way of training them. And they were replaced towards the end of time with the universal laws that Allah wants us to follow for the end. So there were laws meant for the Sahaba for like five years or 10 years to follow as a means of tarbiyah for them, as a means of training them, right? And it wasn't meant, it was never ever meant to be something that people after time are going to follow. So for example, the idda of a widow being one year, that was there initially only for the Sahaba. Allah already knew that for this ummah, the idda is going to be four months and 10 days, right? But that came later when the Sharia was being perfected. Right? So Allah revealed certain things in the beginning as a means of tarbiyah and certain laws came later. We see it also, for example, with the laws of alcohol. That uh, uh, In the early years, you know, there were no laws. Later, the laws became that you shouldn't go to the masjid when you are drunk. Right? And then later on, it became that it's completely prohibited. So this is a gradual revelation. So no one can say, oh, the Quran says, uh, don't go to the masjid when you're drunk. So you get drunk at other times. You can't follow that verse anymore because that verse was meant as a means of tarbiyah for the Sahaba, because understand that there was a culture of, of, of alcohol consumption. People, they were addicted to it. You couldn't just expect them to overnight give it up. So the revelation came gradually. And as it came gradually, whatever laws came before it, it happened. And all of this happened during the lifetime of Rasulullah Sallallahu by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So when we talk about abrogation in Islam, we mean Allah abrogated the law. It can't be done by anybody else. It was done in the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam before the verse was revealed saying today I have to your religion. Right? Before the revelation of that verse, abrogation took place. Right? And so many a times when people claim that the contradiction in the Quran is not a contradiction, it's just a matter of abrogation. Right? And if, if there's more question on that, we can cover it towards the end uh, because we need to move a bit faster now. Okay, this is another one I find very silly. Uh, very often, when the Quran says one thing and the Bible says the other thing, we have people say, oh, here's a mistake in the Quran. Right? They say, oh, here's a mistake in the Quran. For example, uh, the Quran says that, or rather what most of the Muslims believe, the Quran says that uh, Ibrahim al -Islam, uh, had to had a dream to sacrifice his son Ismail. And the Bible says Isaac. Right? So is this a contradiction? Would we call this a contradiction or a mistake in the Quran? Okay, that's a good point. Personally, the names not mentioned in the Quran, right? But it's also the other the main point here is for us, the Bible is not our criteria for, de for deciding what's a mistake and what's not. It's not. We don't consider it that authentic, right? We can produce chains of narrators from us to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi for the Quran. You can't produce that for the Bible. It has been through multiple revisions, multiple editings. 
right? So it's not on the same level of authenticity. So if the Bible says one thing and the Quran says something else, we won't recognize this as a contradiction. We look at this as a correction. That the people before had a wrong understanding of this topic and the Quran came down to correct the understanding of this topic, right? So just because the Bible says one thing and the Quran says opposite, it doesn't mean the Quran is wrong. As Muslims, we should, our default should be that the Bible is probably wrong because maybe this was edited later and added later and it's not from the original revelation to the early prophets. Okay, we have 15 minutes left and four more slides to go to. So this slide I'll go to very quickly. Many times the people claim to have found mistakes in the Quran. It simply means that they uh, did not study the tafsir of that verse. It's as simple as that, right? The entire books of tafsir where they focus on these specific verses, right? Where, for example, uh, in the past century, the great Tunisian Maliki scholar Ibn Ashur, he wrote this massive 30-volume book of tafsir. And a lot of the tafsir focuses on responding to the so-called mistakes in the Quran raised by the Orientalists. So this is a massive masterpiece written in, in the contemporary era. Uh, this is like my main book of tafsir that I reference when I'm teaching, where all of these things are addressed. That if somebody's claiming, oh, this is a problem with the Quran, a mistake in the Quran, or a contradiction in the Quran, you can easily open his tafsir and read the explanation. And unfortunately, it's only available in Arabic, but now there are many websites and YouTube channels that have brought this information into English as well. So many people today have taken up the task of explaining these verses and showing us their proper meaning. The thing about Islamic scholarship is that they never hid these things. Right? If a verse of the Quran seemed confusing, if it seemed difficult to understand, uh, if its meaning seemed problematic, the scholars throughout history, they never hid it. They never said, oh, don't talk about that verse. Don't let people know about that verse. No, they addressed it head on. They bring up that verse in their tafsir. They'll say, this is a verse of the Quran. This is what people think it means. And this is how we understand it. And they'll bring other verses of the Quran to explain it, bring in the hadith to explain it, use tafsir to explain it. But very often, tafsir solves the problem. That if someone tells you this verse is problematic, what's one of the first things you should do to respond to them? You should study the tafsir of that verse. If you study the tafsir of that verse, you should find an answer, inshallah. Okay. The next point is taking the metaphorical literature. Uh, this is one that often makes me laugh. There are so many verses in the Quran and hadiths that are obviously metaphors. They are obviously figures of speech. Right? It's just how people talk. It's just how language is. But very often when people claim they found a mistake in the Quran, it's a metaphor, right? One of the most common examples that really makes me laugh is that you always find this one being brought up by so-called ex-Muslims. They claim one of the reasons I left uh, Islam, they would say, is because the Quran says that Zulqarnain saw the sun set in the muddy water. Therefore, the Quran is saying the earth is flat and the sun sets in muddy water, right? So they say, therefore, the Quran is wrong and Islam is wrong. Islam. Now, what's wrong with this phrase? What's wrong with this line of argument? Because if you open Surah Ka, it does say, Zul Karnain saw the sun setting in muddy water. So what's wrong with the line of argument here? This is a common figure of speech in any language. If you go to the beachfront and you're watching the sunset, you, know, you tell your friends, I, I saw the sun sitting in the beach. Doesn't mean you believe the earth is flat, does it? It doesn't mean that you believe that that's the spot where the sun goes every night. It's a figure of speech is how people talk. Allah is describing what Zul Karnain saw, what was Zul Karnain's experience at that moment. It doesn't mean in any way that the earth promote, that the Quran promotes flat earth theory. Before I get in trouble here though, any flat earthers here, you might get angry with me for making this point. Right? Okay. There is a flat earth movement amongst Muslims in certain countries. Uh, and they base it on this verse as well. But here's, here's the interesting point is that amongst the earliest people to believe that the earth was a globe were Muslims. Then Muslims believed the earth was spherical in nature hundreds of years before the West discovered this. If we are living about 800 years ago, Muslims believed the earth was a sphere and Christians believed it was flat. Why? Because Muslims had no problem going to the science and did not see it in any way as contradicting the Quran. 
Okay, here's another metaphor that they take uh, very literally. Uh, when Maryam Ali Islam's people address her, they say, oh, sister of Harun, how can you do this? So they say, oh, this is a mistake in the Quran. It's calling Mar Mary the sister of Aaron. Again, this is a figure of speech. That it is an honorary title that you call someone sister of or brother of one of their famous ancestors. Right? This is a common figure of speech in Arabic. Many a times, the problem is that, we do, that the person looking at these verses doesn't understand Arabic figures of speech. They may understand English figures of speech, but every language has their own figures of speech. They have their own metaphors, their own similes, their own idioms. Every language has this, not just English. So you have to understand that language's figures of speech in order to understand what these verses are saying. And if you do that, there's no problem, right? That O sister of Harun doesn't mean that she was the sister of Musa Islam. It means she was a descendant of, of, of that family. Right? And this is an honorary title given to her. So it's again a figure of speech being taken literally. And my, finally, we have the nowadays you no know, very blatant misinterpretation of the Quran to make the Quran look bad. The most common one, kill them wherever you find them. Right? This is Surah Toba. I think it's verse 6. Um, you always hear them saying, this, oh, these Muslims, the Quran tells them, kill them wherever you find them. And it's very obvious what this verse means where it was revealed, why it was revealed, what it was revealed for. Even the people who are saying this very often, they know this, but they ignore it because they want to paint a picture of Muslim being bloodthirsty blood for this, right? So what's the meaning of this verse? Can anyone explain it to me? This verse killed them wherever you find them. What's the point? What's the purpose? Where does, how do you explain it? Yes, this is a wartime verse. It was revealed during a specific war, during a specific battle, as a group, of, as an instruction to dealing with a specific group of people. That the Prophet Wasallam's peace treaty with the people of Makkah had just been violated, and they were marching now to go and respond. And this was revealed specifically for the enemies for that battle. It's not a verse that you follow in every context, in every place until the end of time. This is a very specific verse. It doesn't mean that any Muslim anywhere in the world killed anyone left behind. No one in the history of Islam has ever understood it this way. No one, right? Because when Muslims conquered lands, they left the people there to follow their religions. I mean, how long ago did Islam reach India? Does anyone know? All the way back to the first century of Islam. In the time of Walid, even, uh, Walid I, when Muhammad ibn Qasim led his army to parts of India. Right, some Indian pirates had kidnapped some Muslim women, and Muhammad ibn Qasim led an army in there and took over those lands, and those lands became Muslim lands. And over the years, we've had the Delhi Sultanate in India, we've had the Mughal Empire in India. It was ruled by Muslims for hundreds of years, yet still has the majority Hindu population. Why? Because we don't take this verse literally in the way they take it. We don't kill them wherever we find them. We let them be. We let people be. Right? We introduce them to Islam. We do dawah. We rule by Islam, we have Sharia law, but people are free to follow their religions. And this is why you have Christians in Syria, in Egypt, whose ancestors go all the way back to the time of the Sahaba. Because from the time of the Sahaba until now, they have been living in peace, practicing their religion in peace. Because this verse does not mean what our, the enemies of Islam want people to think it means. Another similar example to that, the verse in the Quran, do not take the Jews and Christians as allies, Often they translate it, again, this translation comes in here. They translate it as, do not take Jews and Christians as friends. Right? This is, again, a wartime verse talking about alliances between nations. Right? You cannot ally with a Jewish or Christian nation against Muslim. I want to say, don't say that to certain countries today, but uh, people are getting banned from going to those countries, so don't need to mention it. Right? But Muslim rulers need to know you don't form alliances with the enemies of Islam there's consequences to this, and it is completely haram. It doesn't mean you can't be friendly to Muslim, non-Muslims. It doesn't mean you can't be kind to non-Muslims. It doesn't mean you can't have a non-Muslim pal at school or at work. It doesn't mean anything like that. This is talking about military alliances. That's what this verse is talking about, military alliances against Muslims, right? So again, it's a matter of purposeful misinterpretation, or in some cases, just simple mistranslation. 
So alhamdulillah, we come to the end of the session. And to summarize what we've studied over four hours, we've learned that the miracle of the Quran is multidimensional. In the past, many of us would look at it as either scientific miracle or nobody can write any book like it. And those would be the only two angles we look at it from. I'm saying let's look at it deeper. There are many, many dimensions and layers to the miracle of the Quran, from its poetry to its wording to its effects on the hearts of people, to its impact on society, to its agreement to the fitra, uh, to its descriptions of the past, to its predictions about the future. There are many different dimensions to the miracle of the Quran. Different aspects reach different people. Different aspects hit different people, even amongst the Sahaba. It was different things about the Quran that attracted them to Islam. There were those Sahaba who heard one verse of the Quran and they said, this message makes sense. And they converted to Islam based on the message of one verse of the Quran. And there were those who heard the recitation of a surah and they said, this sound is unlike anything humans have ever produced. And they converted to Islam based on the impact of the Quran on their hearts. And there were those who were masters of poetry and they looked at the poetry of the Quran and they said, this is not something a human can produce. So every aspect appeals to different people. And we want to reach people with the miracle of the Quran. If we want to get out there and really get this message to people, then we have to approach it from a multi-layered multi approach. You can't just take one aspect and expect that to appeal to everyone. You have to bring in different aspects based on the person's personality, based on the person's interest, based on what, that, what state of life that person is going to. Whether it's dealing with the Muslim youth or whether it's dealing with non-Muslim in Dawah, we have to bring in a more uh, multi-dimensional approach to Ijaz al-Quran. Thirdly, we learned that the allegations made against the Quran by those who are saying, oh, the Quran is not a miracle, it's full of mistakes, it's full of contradictions, their arguments are baseless and easily refuted. Just as many websites are out there claiming mistakes in the Quran, there are even more websites correcting. And sometimes the answers are so obvious, it's laughable, right? That if people are so desperate to find a mistake in the Quran, that they're going to mistranslate the verse or purposely misinterpret the verse or lie about the verse, or sometimes they even make up verses. They say, oh, the Quran says this. But when you look at it, there's nothing like it in the Quran. All of this clearly shows that they are you no know, desperate to try and find any mistake in the Quran when there isn't any at all. So how do we, this is our closing notes for all of us, how do we experience the miracle of the Quran? This is the practical part. Every Muslim must develop a relationship with the Quran where you feel its miracle in your life. We look at the Sahaba and we see the, the impact of the Quran in their lives, how it changed them. But they actually experienced real miracles with the Quran. You know, we have the, 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 the story of the famous leader of, of, the, uh, of Medina, uh, I think his name was Usaid, where he's reciting Surah Baqarah and he looks up in the sky and he sees a cloud full of lights above his head, right? And he asked the Prophet, you know, he tells the Prophet about his, about his experience, and the Prophet says that those were the angels of mercy coming to listen to your recitation. So he experienced a miracle through the recitation of the Quran, and many others have as well. So, how do you experience the miracle of the Quran? You recite it on a daily basis, you study it, you study its steps here, you reflect on it, you think about it, and most importantly, you live by it. If you live your life by the Quran, you will more and more see and experience the miracle of the Quran in your life in so many different ways. From the verse of the Quran coming to your mind when you need it, the verses of the Quran healing your heart during difficult times, to your iman reaching levels that you never imagined, tasting the sweetness of faith, all these different miracles come together only when you recite, study, reflect, and try your best to live by the Quran. You have to open your heart to the Quran for it to have that impact. At the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that it is a guidance for those who have taqwa, for those who are conscious of Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whoever seeks guidance, Allah will guide him. So, if someone's heart is closed to the message of the Quran and the miracle of the Quran, no explanation in the world can ever convince him. Why? Because they've closed their heart to it. They have no intention of listening to it. But if someone is sincere, if someone is sincerely seeking the truth, whether they are Muslim or not, and they sincerely engage with the Quran and study the Quran and reflect the Quran and think about the Quran, 
they will find it to be the strongest evidence that Islam is the true religion. And therefore, it is very important when we are doing our da'wah that we bring in the Quran and we bring in the miraculous nature of the Quran and we focus on this in our da'wah. With that, we come to the end. If there are any questions, we can take them now. Yes. Well, the, we say the cutoff point is when the verse was revealed today and perfected for your religion, right? In the last year of the Prophet's life. So there can be no abrogation after that. Once the Prophet's Lord has passed away, there is no abrogation. So no one can come later and say, oh, we need to abrogate this. Or oh, Allah wanted us to abrogate that. You can't do that. The cutoff point was at when that verse was revealed. It means at that point in time, the Sharia is not perfect. And that perfect Sharia has to be followed till the end of time. So abrogation only works within a limited space. You can say the first nine years of the Medina phase of the Prophet's life. That that was a period where laws were revealed, meant to be practiced for five or eight years, and then they were replaced with the perfect laws. Right? So no one can come later and say, that oh, Allah wanted us to abrogate this. You can't say that. Abrogation has to come from Allah. It has to come through a verse of the Quran or through a verse. It can't come through anything else. You mean like in Dawah or? Right, you mean like if somebody's trying to change their life. Uh, okay, so the question, if somebody is trying to change their life, can you apply this method of, of gradualism? Well, that is the method applied throughout history by all uh, you know, the, the, the masters of purification of the soul. That you don't push someone to just give it up. You work on them slowly over time. Right? So you, you, won't, you won't tell them what you're doing is halal. You let them know it's haram. But you take them in phases from the greater haram to a lesser haram to a lesser haram until you know, they reach a point where as close to as good as they can get. So it is, it is, it's the only way to deal with people. Really. And this is called uh, the, the Quranic method of, of Dawah. So for example, if someone converts to Islam today, you don't expect them the next day to be a perfectly pious practicing Muslim every after. You're going to gently bring them into the religion. You're going to teach them what's most important. And then you're going to teach them the next thing. And then teach them the next thing. And over a few years, take them on a journey. Right? You're not going to expect them to be perfect within one day or one week. And we see this even in the hadith, the Prophet Law he, uh, he said when he sent uh, Muad ibn Jabal to Yemen, he said, make things easy for the people, don't make it difficult for them. He said, you are coming to people who are Christians, teach them about Tawheed. If they accept Tawheed, teach them Salah. When they bring Salah, teach them Zakah. So he gave him a step-by-step -step plan. It wasn't in one day, you know, give them everything. It was a step-by-step -step plan to bring them into the community. Right? So, this is the, the Quranic method of da'wah. Again, we won't call it abrogation. And we won't say, oh, it's fine for you to do it. We'll say it's not fine, but we'll cross that bridge later. Now let's, let's take things one step at a time. Right? So that, that's the method we'll do for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it can get very complex. But so in general, when we're doing da'wah, we keep it simple. Now, if you're going to be a tafsir expert, then you go to the complexity of it, right? Uh, but for the average person, you keep it simple, right? There are certain laws that we reveal earlier on and we later abrogate about the laws. And that's all you need to know. Now, whether the verses are still in the Quran or whether Allah lifted the verses, now that gets a bit more technical. If someone brings up a specific verse, if we say yes to this verse, this is how it puts in. Uh, but that knowledge is not necessary uh, to go into everyone because it becomes a very technical science. Abrogation in itself is an entire field of study. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, inshallah. Six days. 
Yes, that, that's a, a better translation. Yeah, it is a better translation. Yeah. So again, you know, many times things are just lost in translation, right? Uh, and the other example of that that we mentioned earlier was, uh, what was it? Forgot. Yeah, allies or friends, right? When people translate it as, do not take Jews or Christians as friends. Yeah, it's a translation issue. Olia doesn't mean friends. Only. It means allies. That's what, hmm? Yeah, it has many meanings. There's multiple layers, right? So Allah says, Allah Allah is the wali of the believers. It doesn't mean friend in the sense of how we know friends. It means he's our guardian and protector. But it has a completely different meaning. So the word has many different meanings. And sometimes when you translate something, uh, the actual meaning of the verse gets lost in translation. So sometimes when someone tells us there's a mistake in the Quran, the first thing to do is check the Arabic. Maybe it's just a translation issue. And that's very, very much the case in many of the examples that they bring up. Okay. okay, if there's no other questions, we can conclude now. Jazakallah for everyone uh, for your time and attention. The next topic, I'd like to tackle proofs of prophethood next because it continues from this. All the proofs that Prophet Muhammad was a true prophet. So we covered one of these proofs, which is the Quran. But there are other ways to prove that you're too proper, right? So I'd like to do four to six sessions on that. Okay, so inshallah, we restart in January. We we'll do four to six sessions on proofs of prophethood. And by the way, uh, at Yakin Institute, we have put together a curriculum for high schools on proofs of prophethood and the miraculous nature of the Quran. It's free to download from our website. Uh, they really help you to teach this at a high school level for children. And inshallah, we should have a book on the proofs of prophethood coming out early next year as well. Okay, so with that, we will conclude. Subhanahu wa rabbi wa rabbi wa wa salam wa rabbi wa salim 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 wa